Coming up next, the booking reads Northanger Abbey. <laughs> Welcome to the Bucketing. My name is Nathan Alverson. I'm your host. He's humble and he's obedient. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> hey, guess who else is here? Who? Hey, I'll introduce him out of order. It's Jake Menzel. Hey. He's a pastor. He's a master. He's not a disaster. He's a vision caster. He's got a blaster. Yeah. He's faster with that blaster. That's what makes me the master. <laughs> I can't think of any more rhymes. Oh, he well. wanted a lady to marry him, so he gassed her. <laughs> or I just asked her. Asked her. her. There you go. Of uh. course. <laughs> I had a choice. He asked her if he could gas her. <laughs> he asked her if he could gas. Hey, folks, it's Jake. Jake, why don't you introduce the other guy? That lame. <laughs> I thought that was me. No, no, no. Oh, wow, that does hurt. <laughs> the other guy is just the person in the room that I haven't referred to. I have no power, so that's not like you. There's no, there's nothing you're getting out of this, Nathan. You're not paid, so you're the other guy. Yeah, you're not, not paid yet. Yet until our but as far as you could all of you guys, our listeners, guy. come through patreoncom forward slash booking and get us up to two thousand dollars a month, and I'll start writing checks to Brandon. It's yep. time to pay up. Yep, and he won't be the other guy anymore. <laughs> yep. Yeah, that's that that that's what it's gonna be from now on. Brandon is the other guy. We're actually gonna make Brandon's life progressively worse until such time <laughs> as you, the listeners, make it better. There you have it, people. So it's Brandon Chastine, the mm-hmm. contextual Texan, mm-hmm. also known as the scholar who's a baller of books, also mm-hmm. known as uh, Ghost Brandon. Uh, mm-hmm. True. Also known as there's a, a new one that needs to be said because people need to support his work. The IP. The IP. Do, 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 do. The, the, oh, the Irish poet, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. I'm so glad that clue worked. <laughs> the Irish Catholic poet. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. The Irish Catholic He's poet. the Irish poet. He's now published in First Things and Caterpillar. I am. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, that gets the introductions out of the way. Did you put the booketing in your bio for First Things and the Caterpillar? I sure hope you did. They didn't ask for a bio for either of those. Oh, but... Oh. No. It was in the letter that I sent to them saying this is a bit about me. But yeah, neither of them put bios. Huh. Lame. Yeah. Well, if you ever, ever have a chance to put the booking in a bio, that'd be cool. But they put my poem on their Facebook page. That was nice. Cool. Nice. The they first tag things? you? No, they didn't. Hmm. Huh. They probably don't know how tagging works. They probably don't. They're, no, they're first things. Yeah. yeah. This is dumb publication. Yep. Yeah, <laughs> anyone who's published in there. <laughs> the pretty, idiot. Pretty fraud. <laughs> pretty lame. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Speaking of idiots, uh huh, Jane Austen. <laughs> Jane Austen liked to make fun of them, and uh, she's who we're talking about in her book Northanger Abbey. She was not an idiot. She's not who we're talking about. We're, we don't appear in the book Northanger Abbey talking about. Anyway, folks, baggage. <laughs> oh, Bob! There goes the plane. It's <laughs> 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 me, fat airplane. <laughs> Hey, Fat Airplane. Hey. Our latest character. Yes. Hey, oh, 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 Fat Airplane. It's me, King Laugh. Oh, hey, King oh, Laugh. What's oh, going oh. on? Hey, You're hey, such hey. a fat airplane. You know it, man. Oh, oh. Just flying over, dropping this baggage here, yeah. Oh, 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 I'm a little scared of Fat Airplane. <laughs> Why don't you let me drop this baggage right on you now, and I'm going to be off to drop off some more baggage, yeah. Oh, 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 I'm terrified for my my life. <laughs> well, I'm going to be flying on now. Okay. Bye. Oh, oh. So my baggage with yeah, this- Yeah, uh, with Northanger Abbey. <laughs> yeah, with Northanger Abbey. Is oh, the... hey, wait, uh, King Laugh and- Fat airplane are leaving. Bye, guys. Bye. 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 Oh, 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 bye. Jake, you're my favorite. <laughs> Thanks. Aw, your uh, fat airplane's favorite. That's it's very disturbing. Can we change the name of this show to the Fat Airplane Show? <laughs> <laughs> and feature that character, that, that breakout maybe character? Maybe it should have been Al's name instead of you could call me 
Al. <laughs> you can call me Fat, fat Al. <laughs> fat Al Plane. Yeah, Fat Al Plane. <laughs> Stupid. Never mind. It's great um, stuff. Hey, guess what? Baggage. Fat Al Plane. Guess, guess who's to... riding first class in me today? <laughs> Hey guys, it's me, Britney Spears. Oh my god! Oh wow, it's Britney Spears. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna, I'm doing nope. some parachuting. No nope. baggage. Bye. Wait, baggage. Have you ever, have you ever uh, done uh, parachuting before? No. Oh. <laughs> Not even sure it works. Bye. <laughs> ah! Bye. It's great, guys. Bye. Fat airplane. <laughs> we never knew. <laughs> <laughs> this is the one. We're... Can I just it say it's the one we're keeping? I, I love fat airplane. I feel a lot of affection for him. <laughs> I'm sure he's going to be back. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Every episode. This is, the, this is not like Blue's Clues. All the things are alive. And <laughs> yeah, no. We had to, Six shooters need to be alive now, too. We had to hear from the Phantom all those years. Now we have a new stable of characters. We got Fat Airplane. We got King Laugh. <laughs> Britney Spears. We got Britney Spears. Yeah. Who, who else has showed up with her? Oh, do we have the Night of in- Infinite Resignation <laughs> show up one time, maybe? <laughs> I wonder if he'll show up. <laughs> I have no idea how he talked. <laughs> I forget. Yeah, <laughs> Jake, the thing that you said about—I'm <laughs> not getting off fat airplane. When you said we should call you, when you said we should call him fat airplane, alplane, alplane. Yeah, <laughs> that was really funny. And you were self obviously, and you were self-deprecating <laughs> about it. You were like, oh, and sorry, I said that, but <laughs> I thought that was it was worth it. One of the funniest things that's been said on this podcast. I love fat alplane. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> I love that album. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> the end, that'll be the ending of my novel. He loved Fat Alpine. <laughs> <laughs> he reached out and touched the pine needles. <laughs> he finally learned to love Fat Alpine. <laughs> what? <That's okay. laughs> oh no. <laughs> uh, we are all just <laughs> posts in a stream. <laughs> We're posting this. Well, oh. just boats. <sighs> learning, finally learning to love Fat Alplane. Yes, we're all just boats. <laughs> finally learning. If that's the, swept. I think we have yeah. our t-shirts. <laughs> we're all just boats. <laughs> Either we're all just boats learning to love Fat Alplane or just... <laughs> I love Fat I, I love Alplane. Fat Alplane. And we need a picture of Fat Alplane, too. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, folks, we don't ask you for much. <laughs> Send us a picture of Fat Alplane, please. <laughs> we want one. <laughs> we don't want one. We want eight. Eight, yeah. At eight. least. We went 25 pictures of that alplane. We know you're out there. We want to be able to choose the best one to put on next year's t-shirt. Yeah, the winner will uh, go on our t-shirt. I, some of the art that we've gotten from you guys is absolutely amazing. Right. Yeah, it is pretty awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm thinking of specific pieces right now. Yeah, some really cool stuff. Yeah. So We love getting art. We love getting mail in general. So Yeah. Send, Send it our way. Art and fan mail. This show and the Chip and Lance show... Get us the most artwork and fan mail mm-hmm. by far. And death threats too. Those are always fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, those only happen on Twitter and now Twitter's cracking down on that, obviously. Yeah, obviously. Oh, that's right, yeah. Obviously. <laughs> obviously. <laughs> <laughs> Jake, your baggage. I don't think I want to give my, I think I tried to give my baggage. I think Fat Alplane <laughs> flew baggage. off with my baggage. <laughs> <laughs> Gone. It's he forgot gone. to drop it off. <laughs> Fat Alplane is known for sucking the memories about literature out of people's brains. <laughs> Part of Fat Alplane. That's, that's official Fat Alplane canon. Yeah. Uh, my baggage with... <laughs> I almost wanted to say with Fat Alplane. <laughs> with, with Northanger Abbey. I always wanted to see Fat Alplane. <laughs> okay, go ahead. We've been podcasting for a long time today, folks. Yeah, so have this pity is on like us. episode... Seven or yeah. eight or something. I don't know. Mm-hmm. I first read Austin like six or seven years ago. Nathan's recommendation, thinking Austin was uh, just the kind of goopy romance trash that characterizes things like that uh, dumb version of Pride and Prejudice with Kira Knightley. Pretty um, much the stuff that Jane Austen's making fun of in yeah. his book. Yeah, exactly. So Nathan finally convinced me to give Pride and Prejudice a shot, and, which I did while I was preaching through a dating and relationship series for my college students. And Good time to do that. It was a great time to do it, and it was awesome, and loved it. And that's part of what I think part of the snowball that led to this podcast coming about. It's not the one event that we 
we we have an event that we point to, mm-hmm. but but I, I think this was still one of the convergence points for sure. Yeah, for sure. And so since then, we I reread it for our episode, our very uh, very first episode we ever did on the show, and then every other Austin novel since then has been a new experience for me. So I'd not read Northanger Abbey before now, just like I'd not read. Emma or Mansfield Park or Sense and Sensibility or anything else prior to coming to the show and have only uh, grown in my appreciation and love for Austin. Although I think there's some that I'm, I'm always happy to come back to Austin, but but there are some that are Abbey Road and then there are some that are Beatles for sale or. Right. Exactly. So it's all the Beatles, but. So yeah. So I was excited to come to Northanger Abbey, especially coming out of Dostoyevsky. Which is a different experience. It, it's the opposite experience of coming out of War and Peace. You come out of War and Peace uh, into Austin, and suddenly Austin feels relatively thin and flat, which is not fair. Mm-hmm. But it's because Tolstoy is just the man. He's just on another <laughs> plane. In not fat out plane. Not fat out plane. Just not a different plane. It's just a different plane. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Specifically, not fat out plane. Actually. <laughs> It, yeah, so so it's just whatever you read after something like War and Peace, it's going to be unfair unless you get some kind of palate cleanser mm-hmm. in there. But coming out of the Brothers Karamazov is just like breath of fresh air. Yes. It's so nice to come to somebody who just is sensible and fun and funny and understands people way better than Dostoevsky does in one of her simplest novels. And so... Yeah. You, First impression, it's cute, it's fun. Not her best work, but very readable and enjoyable. So, Brandon, your baggage. I don't have much baggage with this one. This is one of my blind spots with Austin, so this was my first time to read it. Nice. Yeah, this in Mansfield Park, so, were my blind spots. Going into the booking. Yeah, going into the there. booking. Yeah. So, and I enjoyed reading it. It was fun. I think it does rank... Well, we'll talk, I guess, more about it on next episode. It's not like up towards my... T- the, it wouldn't make the top three of my favorite Jane Austen novels, but it's it's not bad. It's good. No. It mm, <clears throat> might be number six, maybe. Yeah, I mean... Eh, maybe not. Yeah, well, we'll, 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 we'll debate really this out now because we got another episode. Basically, folks, folks, we're doing Northanger Abbey today. Next week, we're going to do a, an Austen recap where we talk about the best of Austen, the worst of Austen, the... Yeah. Anyway. But even for, I guess, with Jane Austen, even her weakest work is still great. Yeah. Yeah, it's like a bad Beatles album or a bad Shakespeare play or something like that. You're still in the hands of a master. But yeah, this was my second time reading this novel. I had read this one before and enjoyed it. I had read all of Austen. The only Austen that I think I hadn't read going into the bookening experiment was Sense and Sensibility, weirdly enough. Hmm. But now I have read all the Austin since I got Sense and Sensibility. Got that notch in my belt last year. And... The Juvenalia, you've read that? I have read excerpts. I have not read all the Juvenalia. I have not read Lady Susan. I have read most of her letters. I'm an Austin fanboy. I'm a part of the Jane Austen Society or an Austinite or a Janeite. That's what Kipling called them, I think. So... You can read that Rudyard Kipling story, The Jane Knights, folks, if you desire to read a Rudyard Kipling story. It's a pretty good one, I guess. Is he in favor of the Jane Knights? Well, he uses her as a symbol of old British society. And so all these kinds of old people, as I, I'm remembering this very faintly, it's been a while, but people who look longingly on the past are the Jane Knights. Okay. Which is one reason that people do read Jane Austen is because they just want to live in that world. But that's never been why I think any of us like to read Jane Austen. Quite the opposite, no. actually. If you told no. me, oh, you're going to read a book about carriages and balls and like downtown Abbey. Can't stand that thing. Bridgerton Don't. or whatever that's called. Bridgewater. Yeah. No interest in Bridgewater or. More like Bilgewater. Yeah. More like Bilgewater. Oh, yeah. Uh, I don't know why I said, oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm going home. <laughs> Give me a shower in bilge water. <laughs> yeah. What, why do you want a shower in bilge water? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> just keep going. Listen, any type of shower is going to be an improvement for Brandon. So yeah, just, just let him, that's true. Let him go. There are lots of flies. 
Yeah, the bilge water might take care of the flies, but it might infect the sores, <laughs> which would just make things worse, really. Yeah. Well. Well, guys, <laughs> there's some baggage. And there was some. There was some. You're welcome, Fat Al Plane. <laughs> no, 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 no. Do not, Brendan, you cannot bring back. I have nothing to do with it. Okay, you. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. You're the one who we've... we've Fat Al Plane, from. get out. We don't need you. Yeah, okay. Maybe next episode, I'll go back. Okay, bye. Bye. All right. That took care of him. a lonely guy. Yeah, <laughs> I, I told him. I, I, I kind of figured him for an anthropomorphized him. airplane. Yeah. Is he actually a, just a guy named Fat Al Plane? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, he's an anthropomorphized. He's like blue, from Blue's Clues or something. Yeah, like that, yeah, yeah. Like JJ the Plane. Yeah, we're, we're all the same We're like Pee Wee's Playhouse, but. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, please. Well, guys, I think we've already kind of said it, but. <clears throat> and my throat is full of phlegm. Mm. <laughs> I've already said that. <laughs> yeah. So. <laughs> No, we haven't already said my thoughts, so that's oh. the first time we're hearing about that. Uh, Northanger Abbey, what'd you think about that Northanger Abbey, fellas? Minor Austin, I think we sounds like we all agree. Yeah, it's cute and fun and funny, and it doesn't fail in any way except to deliver on any expectation for some great one-liners and some real in- character insight that she may have established in, in other novels. Right. Which, if you take it on its own terms, it's just, it's a nice, fun little novel. Yeah. And certainly if, you, if you're familiar with any Enjoyable. of the gothic stuff, or even if you're not. It, it is funny. It's a cute parody. Yeah. Yeah. When she finds the, when she's all worried in the room, once she gets to Northanger Abbey. It's great. That stuff's pretty funny when she finds the laundry list. And, well, and it, yeah. what's, yeah, what's so fun about that is Austin, I think, ended up successfully creating more suspense for me than one of those yeah. gothic novels would. Like, it's the first time I have been tempted, and not just tempted, fell into temptation to spoil the novel for myself. Because mm-hmm. I felt such just, is she really gonna blow this for herself? Oh, the scene where she's investigating the mother's room yeah. is excruciating. Yeah, is she really gonna lose this guy? Is she gonna lose Henry? Is she gonna lose... Yeah. Is she going to blow this all up by being such an idiot? I need to figure out what's going to happen. I knew that they ended, I remembered that they ended up together because I'd read it before, but when she's snooping around in that room, first of all, I I had this like that. I had this vague idea in my head. She might get caught. And this helped. This really did help with the tension. I had this vague idea in my head that somebody in this room on some episode at one point or another said that Catherine's the one Austin heroine to not have a happy ending or to get what she deserves or mm-hmm. something like that in my head. And I don't know if it's a false memory or what. <laughs> yeah. I'm not sure why we would have said that, but it, it's gotta be some kind of false memory or something that was from a different novel that I just imported to Northanger Abbey. But I had this fear or thought in my head that maybe somebody at some point had spoiled that she actually blows it. And Austin gives her a bad ending. And that would be so depressing if that's where this novel went. It would have been depressing. And I got really uptight about it for that reason. Mm -hmm. I was like really concerned. And so... You were surprised. But I mean, it it provides that tension. Once I spoiled it for myself, I was like, oh yeah, of course that's what she would do. That's the Jane Austen that I know and I'm glad. But still, like... Well, a couple of things She created that tension. Great about the tension. She does build it. Like that moment where he catches her on the staircase. Yeah, that's... that's Because that's yeah. you don't know what he's going to do. But yeah. she also uses it to help... <laughs> he kind of blows it off. Exactly. That's what I was going to say. She yeah. uses it to kind of help you like him better. Yeah. Because even though he's one of her more kind of sardonic, witty yeah. heroes... Yeah, he's a bit of an outlier in terms of her heroes. Well, yeah, because he's always kind of, he's a little bit of a Willoughby. He's kind of playing along and having a little bit of fun. Yeah, he almost talks more like one of her villains. Just But then, but right there you see his yeah. character because he does just kind of blow it off. It's like, okay, whatever. He tells her off. I mean, it is a Later. little bit of a proto right. nightly scene. He's a little hard on her. He says, "Could you? why would you possibly have yes. maintained these notions? Yes, but she's worried that it's going to last longer than it does. He kind of seems to have forgotten about it in the next yeah. scenes. Yeah. Uh, there's, this is one of those novels where Austin's a little coy with the tone of Henry. Mm -hmm. Like you could read Henry as almost being nasty on a regular basis Yes, to Catherine, or you could read him as being just sort of sweet and playful and tongue in cheek and teasing Mm -hmm. in a way that's not, not nasty, but 
I don't know. She doesn't go out of her way to solve that. Usually the hero gets to do some act of moral awesomeness. So you're like, oh, of course. You understand. Yeah. But but there's some real ambiguity in the tone of Henry here that you can, I felt like she was, she was being coy. She wasn't giving you a lot to go on with how to, how to read him. Which I think fits in with the gothic overtone. She's kind of playing around with his character. He's like, so where he's made kind of. You th- don't know if he's making fun of the woman when he claims that he knows a lot about linens or mm-hmm. not. You just yeah. don't know if he's serious or if he's joking around with these people. Like, you don't know what to think of him. I went back and forth with reading this book and listening to it on audio. Yeah. And my reader gave Henry a pretty nasty tone. Dude being pretty yes. sarcastic. He's yeah. pretty nasty. Same. Which wasn't how I'd been reading Henry, which yeah. is part of what clued me. So it's possible because I, uh, I don't like to read Austin on audio. I like to read her for myself. I don't like to read lots of things. Some things I do, but maybe I'm saying more about, maybe that applies more to other to other novels than I realize because of that. Yeah. Very different take on Henry, right. but I, I don't think so. I don't think so. No, he definitely has more of that sardonic edge, but I wasn't reading him as bitingly as the person. As that your I, reader? Yeah. Yeah. So... Because I was doing the same thing. I was mixing, listening and reading as I was driving. But it does make you wonder, like... Listening while I was driving, reading. In terms of the romance, it is the least credible romance. You mm-hmm. said that Henry's certainly not the typical Austin protagonist. Right. Catherine, I'm not... Sh- she doesn't have a whole lot to commend herself. I really think that the last... Austin cleans it up a little bit, and it's a sweet little moment at, at the very end of the book when... She just has that little throwaway line about, as opposed to the gothic hero, he fell in love with her because he noticed that she really liked him and yeah. that made him feel good. <laughs> and hey, that happened. I, I, or, I mean, actually what she says is, I know that never happens and actually it's always destined I to the lo- stars. I love and- it. Well, I love it because it also um, speaks as much to the truth of how relationships work than mm-hmm. how certain people in, in even in our our circles that whole cliche of if you're a real manly man, you go and marry the woman that you love and not the woman that yeah, and it falls Christian in love with you. That's right? very much the thing. And, and, and there's, there's something to that. If you are lazy and you take the low hanging fruit that you're not going to be happy with because you just want things to be easy, that's a recipe for a bad marriage. Okay. And we all understand that intuitively, but there is something to be said for the, relationship that starts because man's going a direction and a woman's like, yo, Mm -hmm. I got to get this guy's attention because he's awesome and I really like him. Mm -hmm. And she does. And then he realizes, oh, wait, she's part of her being attracted to me is like, she gets it. She gets what I'm about. She Mm -hmm. gets where I'm going and she wants to help and be a part of, this is awesome. Yeah. This can work. Well, and I often think that's how a Catherine type woman will attach herself because the book makes a point of she's not striking. She's not, doesn't have any great virtue or beauty or anything like that. She's just sweet and amiable and she has good qualities. I think any yeah. man should be happy to marry her, but yeah, Henry kind of needs her to <laughs> lock onto him so that he would even consider the idea. Yeah. Which has more insight in it than anything in that stupid Brothers Karamazov that Brandon's going on. I love that book. About so much. Yeah. If only every woman could be like Katerina Ivanovna. Yeah, or Grushinsk. Or Grushinsk, yeah. man. Uh, yeah. I mean, Jane Austen just wishes she could write women with as much accuracy as Grushinsk. <laughs> well, what I like about this book, I think, is, I mean, I like several things, but I just really have grown over the years, I think, more and more to appreciate the fact about Austen that she does not flatter you, the reader, by proxy. She does not generally write a protagonist in such a way that you can say, oh, I am I would be like that protagonist and therefore I would be great. I realize some people read Elizabeth Bennet that way, but I don't think that that's how she's written. It's certainly not how Emma's written. It's certainly not how most of these characters, the persuasion chick, I don't even remember what her name is. Anne? Anne, yeah. I mean, they have real virtues and real things that you can look up to and aspire to in, in her heroines, but Generally speaking, it's the opposite of the thing we always talk about in Harry Potter, where it's like, we can all put ourselves in Harry Potter's shoes, and then we can all be validated by the fact that Harry Potter's always right about everything, and all the adults are idiots, and Jane Austen's like, no, teenagers are kind of dumb, I was kind of dumb, you're kind of dumb, you'd 
probably yep they need to be protected by wise <clears throat> fathers and mothers and aunts and uncles and when they're not they do stupid things and sometimes they learn their lessons quickly and sometimes they go off and marry uh wickham wickham's or willoughby's or, or willoughby or whatever and these things are uh rarely as romantic but often can be much better than your stupid romance novels right well and i don't know i some of the what i'm bringing to this is just having i just ended to move to evansville to a church plant with jake i just ended my time of being a helper at our old church's youth group and i think oh, that's a lot of the lens that i'm seeing it through this this the, reading the book this particular time it's oh i recognize this girl because she's kind of flighty and and dumb and mm-hmm. and actually to be honest that's most of maybe every once in a while you meet an Elizabeth Bennett in the youth group, but mostly they're flying in. Dumb. Yeah, you're definitely going to have some Emmas. We all know there's going to be an Emma or two, yeah. and maybe you'd probably be some Fannies sitting in the corner. Yeah, but actually, what you meet a lot of is this girl. She's sweet. She's kind of dumb. <laughs> Just naive. She's naive. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, I'm, <clears throat> I'm speaking crassly, folks. What Not I mean about is intelligence. She's but she's, about, she's yeah. unformed. She doesn't have experience Mm -hmm. she's naive she sort of needs to when she gets a little experience she's gonna feel really dumb Mm -hmm. about the places where she's been naive and that's the normal process we all walk through right and it's sweet a lot of times to watch those people sometimes don't end up well but more often than not in a good context with good authority around and stuff god is kind and that person makes their mistakes and they find their henry tilney of a varying degree of quality and they get married and it's just fine. And God smiles on us through our dumbness and our naivete. And I like that Jane Austen, I think better than almost any author for being someone who can be as acerbic and nasty and cutting about human nature. She feels pretty generous in her view of for God's sovereignty. Oh, this is actually a pretty kind universe where you can be naive and there are protections in place. And yes, there are Isabella Thorpe's and yes, John Thorpe's and General Tilney's. There are nasty people out there and people who want to take advantage, but as often as not, the universe smiles and these things do actually work out simply not because anybody really deserves it or is all that great, but because God is kind. Yeah. John Thorpe has to be a take on some <clears throat> Ann Radcliffe hero, right? Oh, the boorish... I'm the sure the Boris guy yeah. who's going to force the girl to go on the wild carriage rides and manipulate yeah. his way into yeah, and she's just showing what that would actually she's do. She's supposed to fall in love with his boorish ways. And well, it's a little bit like roguish and yeah. whatever, and instead yeah. he's actually just a he's just kind a of a boar. Yeah, a boar. Yeah. yeah, that's the word I was definitely looking for. <laughs> it's what Lewis says about in his preface to Paradise Lost about Satan. He says everybody says this character is so well evoked and everything, but would you actually want to hang out with them? He seems like this brooding, baronic force of evil, but it wouldn't actually be that much fun to to be with this guy. Yeah, and that's be. always how those like a Rochester. Exactly, it would Rochester's not. Who, I'm sure you were thinking could, yeah. Yeah. exactly who I was thinking. Like of. Rochester is a narcissistic jerkwad. Yeah, for for lack of the word that I can't say on the podcast, and it, he's no fun to work yeah. for. No, a, a Jane Eyre of any you sense. Would not want to. You would not want to be a servant in that house. No. You would not feel good about, what, do you want to be one of his kids? Like, uh, come on. No, you don't want to be the neglected little French girl. You don't want to be one of the staff. No. <laughs> Certainly and don't want to be his first wife. You, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> so. <clears throat> and that sort of selfish, narcissistic brooding thing is romanticized in books like that. Right. And. Yep. yep. And, and, and has successors all the way down to Edward, Ed, Edward, uh, Edward Cullen and. Yeah. And uh, Kylo Ren, and w- what's the Christian Gray? And yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, well, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I was thinking this is a pretty good mockery of Rochester right here in Thorpe, mm-hmm. yeah, or that type, yeah, absolutely. Other deep insights <clears throat> into Northanger Abbey. I don't know that we're gonna get that much conversation out this, of this, this one. It's not a whole lot, not a whole lot. Can I read a couple of my favorite parts, please? One of the best things is when she quotes some of this poetry here at the beginning. I don't know if you remember this. Oh, yeah. But from 15 to 17, she was in training for a heroine. She read all such works as heroines must read to supply 
Their memories were those quotations which are so serviceable and so soothing in the vicissitudes of their eventful lives. Which is funny because in a lot of Victorian novels, everybody knows all these poetic quotes, and she's kind of poking fun at that. Who actually has these things just memorized yeah. <laughs> and ready to go at a moment's notice. And she's saying yeah. that here that some people do it on purpose so that they'll just have them ready <laughs> right. to say. So far, her improvement was sufficient and many other points. She came on exceedingly well. For though she could not write sonnets, she brought herself to read them. And though there seemed no chance of her throwing a whole party into raptures by a prelude on the pianoforte, of her own composition, she could listen to other people's performance with very little fatigue. With very little fatigue. Yeah. So you get stuff like that. It's pretty fun. Mm-hmm. And then the other thing I love here is when she brings up novels. So, yes, novels, for I will not adopt that ungenerous and politic custom, so common with novel writers, of degrading by their contemptuous censure the very performances to the number of which they are themselves adding, joining with their greatest enemies and bestowing the harshest epithets on such works, and scarcely ever permitting them to be read by their own heroine, who, if she accidentally take up a novel, is sure to turn over its insipid pages with disgust. Alas, if the heroine of one novel be not patronized by the heroine of another, from whom can she expect protection and regard? I cannot approve of it. Let us leave it to the reviewers to abuse such effusions of fancy at their leisure, and and over every new novel to talk in threadbare strains of the trash with which the press now groans. Let us not desert one another. We are an 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 injured body. Although our productions have afforded more extensive and unaffected pleasure than those of any other Literary corporation in the world, no species of composition has been so much derided or decried. From pride, ignorance, or fashion, our foes are almost as many as our readers. All right, so from pride, ignorance, or fashion, our foes are almost as many as our readers. And while the abilities of the 900th the Bridger of the History of England, or of the man who collects and publishes in a volume some dozen lines of Milton, Pope, and Pryor, with a paper from the Spectator and a chapter from Stern, are eulogized by a thousand pens, There seems almost a general wish of decrying the capacity and undervaluing the labor of the novelist, and of sliding the performances which have have only genius, wit, and taste to recommend them. I am no novel reader. I seldom look into novels. Do not imagine that I often read novels. It is really very well for a novel. Such is the common cant. And what are you reading, miss? Oh, it is only a novel, replies the young lady, while she lays down her book with affected indifference or momentary shame. It is only Cecilia or Camellia or Belinda, or in short... Only some work in which the greatest powers of the mind are displayed, in which the most thorough knowledge of human nature, the happiest delineation of its varieties, the liveliest effusions of wit and humor are conveyed to the world in the best chosen language. Now had the same lady been engaged with a volume of The Spectator, as was like their New Yorker at the time, without the short stories. Instead of such a work, how proudly would she have produced the book and told its name, though the chances must be against her being occupied by any part of the voluminous publication, of which either the matter or manner would not disgust a young person of taste, the substance of its papers so often consisting in the statement of improbable circumstances, unnatural characters, and topics of conversation, which no longer concern anyone living. And their language, too, frequently so coarse as to give no very favorable idea of the age that could endure it. Anyways, I like that. That's her defense of the novel and what she's doing with her craft, and I think it's pretty great. And also some choice words for the spectator. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, a couple of reasons I like that. One, it's fun to see her stop, and she has some fun with it, too. She also lets Moreland be a little silly with mm-hmm. her taste for novels, and right. so she knows that there's a bad side to it. She has Thorpe say these exact same things to her, right, with novels, like he doesn't really read them. Right. But also I think that especially so like growing up with in the homeschooled reform crowd a lot of people pride themselves on growing up and then therefore growing out of novels and so all they'll read now and they make a big point of it is they'll only read histories or they only read biographies that's all they read anymore yep. or theology and austin makes a pretty good case as to why that's kind of a, a silly reason to throw out fiction too mm-hmm. because in it are collected we've talked a lot about good insights into character you can lo- learn a lot about reading and understanding people from good novelists. You can read a lot about writing. You can learn a lot about language and wit and humor from good novelists. All these things that she's laying out, I think, are true. And it's fun to see a novelist of her stature kind of give her defense Mm -hmm. like that. So anyways, it was one of my favorite parts. Yeah, I like that part too. I like when she calls out novelists who write novels where the characters don't like reading novels or above yeah that drives me yeah. nuts you're watching an episode of some hbo show and the character's an idiot because they like to watch tv yeah. it isn't american society fat and stupid and degraded and it's like 
Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's a TV show. <laughs> fat person watching your show, like <laughs> yeah. Spielberg did it in. Uh, uh, oh yeah, we talked a lot about that on the Poltergeist episode. Poltergeist, yeah. Well, Spielberg. One of the reasons did. that Dad stinks is because Dad sits around and watches TV. Yeah, yeah. that whole movie is Falls like asleep watching TV. This dumb consumerist society, while where <laughs> businessmen just want to sell you stuff, and like oh, Steven Spielberg. You invented that society, dude. Come on. <laughs> How long will the workers keep building them new ones? As long as their soda cans are red, white, and blue ones. Really, really it's any movie that has an anti-consumerist message or an anti-corporate corporate message, which is like every third movie you watch. It's like... Yeah. <sighs> it's like I always say about Rage Against the Machine. They were propagated by the machine. But they could rage against it. They, well, designed by the machine. Yep. yep. I mean, as an outlet for people who want to rage against that machine. Yep. yep. So that they will have an outlet that is still the machine while continuing. It's almost like we're all part, part of the matrix. The it is. Yeah, you, we're all. It's the simulation, man. Yep. So they've given us the war to fight, only for them to be the ones to be in charge of the war. Yep. We're living in Oceania, man. Or wait, yeah. Oceana's 1984, right? Yep. Yep. We love Fat Alplane. <sighs> love you too. <laughs> <laughs> well, anybody got any more? Oh, I, I'll tell you one other thing I thought about this book that uh, just came home to me as I ended my time th- with this particular youth group and thought about my experience with teenagers and people of that age. It might be tempting for somebody to read this novel and think that Catherine Moreland's naive obsession with these gothic novels and her basing her life on them is somehow phony or exaggerated or oh, please but oh please yeah. every one of these kids is building their life around some illusion that hollywood feeds them yeah i mean in the 90s it was it was your sitcoms mm-hmm. right your sitcoms defined the way that you talk the way that you dress the way that you tried to interact with your friends. And deeper than that, the way that you thought that social structure, that authority, that hierarchy, that uh, yep. sexual politics worked. Yep. You just learned that you from TV. You just conformed it. You conformed your f- friend group to friends or to Seinfeld or to something like that. Saved by the Bell. Saved by the Bell younger, yeah. if you were younger. Mm-hmm. Fresh Prince. Just, you conformed to all those things. That's where you took your cues from. Right. Yep. That's right. And if you want to go a little bit deeper, I mean, how many of these kids, how many kids that you do you, you live as if they know they're not so gauche as to say, if I believe in myself, I'll get exactly what I want. But that's what they believe. And they believe that because the Walt Disney Corporation has been telling them since they were yeah, a little child. That they deserve it. It's owed to them. You deserve it. And so they just live as if things are owed to them. They don't work. They expect other people to bend over backwards to make their dreams come true. It's like they're living in a fantasy land, and it's not just the arrogance of youth. It's it's their culture that they've drunk in. Mm-hmm. So you don't have to walk very far to see a Catherine Moreland. I mean, just fine. Just go to the mall, and you'll be surrounded by nothing but Catherine Mo- Moreland's who yeah. sucked in whatever the entertainment is. And Catherine, Catherine Moreland is the good version. Yeah, yeah. Catherine Moreland's like the sweet Christian girl that is a little bit above it and just got sucked in by something kind of silly. Yep. But I mean, where you actually see this is with sex. People cue their sexual mores and mores off of TV shows. Like yeah. they, they think that's how yep. life works. And that's not really how life works. Read Jane Austen if you want to know how life works. <sighs> Not to be political, but how many people derive their whole meta narrative? I mean, how much of this whole, all the political unrest, everything that we've been seeing is people building their cultural cues off of us versus them TV shows, off of yep. this kind of person is bad, this kind of person's a monster. I mean, yep. Or the way that we should think about the world is an us versus them. And so. Of course, we're the good guys and they're the bad guys, whoever they happen to be. Yeah. Yeah. We've talked a lot about that with Guardians of the Galaxy. Guardians of the Galaxy to like me that. is one of the sickest examples, but you just watch the something like even the Mandalorian, something as innocuous as that. It's like it's a band of good guys and everyone else is a fascist who deserves to be shot. Or it's just in the way of our team. Right. right? Yeah. I mean, when your mission is save baby Grogu, 
everybody's a target. Yeah, it doesn't really you matter. Have, you have the highest possible mission because he's so cute. There's no such thing as collateral damage. Right. Exactly. When your mission's high enough. Yep. Yep. Or all collateral damage is justifiable is the better way to frame it. Yep. So, yeah. I mean, I guess I'm just saying obvious things. People drink in their culture and it becomes a part of how they act. But I just I wouldn't want anyone to read this book and think that Catherine Marland was in the least bit exaggerated because I just don't think... I just don't think that that's true at all. I think it's just really easy to see her as exaggerated because we're so far removed from being influenced by this kind of thing. Although, heck, Twilight is this kind of thing. Fifty Shades is this kind of thing. Exactly. People certainly take their romantic cues from those. Yep. <laughs> but I mean, well, there are a lot of sensible people that are able to stand outside of Fifty Shades of Grey. There aren't as many sensible people that are able to stand outside of some of the deeper meta narratives that our culture has, which... Uh, 200 years from now will seem just as silly mm-hmm. as us reading about Catherine. <sighs> Any final thoughts about Northanger Abbey, Brandon? No, I gave my final thought. Final thoughts about Northanger Abbey, Jake? Nope. All right. Well, folks, we'll be back next week with some thoughts on the Jane Austen's entire oeuvre. Now that we've read it all, we'll summarize the first six years of Austen and then move on to the next six years of Austen. But Right now, got to do some donor shout-outs. Brandon, why don't you say the name of the person that you want your son to grow up to be? And Jake, why don't you say the name of the person that you admire the most and base your entire pastoral ministry on? Got it. I think I did it, folks. I think I finally broke the code. I think we'll find out. First, I have to pull up the patrons, which I am trying to do. All right, Robert and Rhonda the Lovebirds. Dracula. The Artful Anthony Dodger. Frankenstein. Well, I guess if that's what you guys think. Little Anthony Cigar Store. Dracula. The person you want your son to grow up to be like. The immortal <laughs> Chelsea E. Frankenstein. You brace your entire pastoral ministry on this. Bringing the dead to life, baby. That's legitimate. <laughs> you want your son to grow up to be a blood-sucking aristocrat. Yeah, of course. <laughs> there you go. It worked out for everybody. Jim and Beam, the uh, Lenny uh, Oakley. Uh, no. Dracula. Leading to the kind of young man who embraces eternal life. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I guess. Frankenstein. If nothing else, <laughs> Dracula was a young man who embraced eternal life. You can say that much for him. <laughs> Jim uh, and Lanny Oakley, Dracula, the Lady of the Valley, Andrew and Esther the Lovebirds, Dracula, the Keith Master, David's Money Man, Chucky, and Johnny Joe, Little Baby Max, Jamie, Jamie, you were cold and love cheats, and also C.S. Lewis, including Toby, Fairy Monster, Princess of Mother, Princess of Mother, Prime Adam, Jeremy, the Dark Lord of Death, Nathan, not me, Mara, Ryan, Red Avengers, Dude, the Blaze of Justice, DJ, Sammy, G, Benny, and Danny, Two Furious, Eric, Catherine, Leon, Window Breaks, Professor, Lady X, Lavender's Green, Dylan, Dylan, Noah, Constrictor, Mara, Chief, the Fairy, 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 Chief, Eric and Kate, the camp champ kings who are warm and love bees. Maddie, 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 Burgers. <laughs> Hi, Alplane. <laughs> or Fat Alplane. <laughs> Sooner. Oh, <man. laughs>